We're going to be speaking to some of the creators uh, behind Netflix's uh, productions in Europe. Uh, first up, I'd like to introduce Baran Bo Oda and Jansje Friese, who are working on Netflix's first uh, original produ series produced in Germany, Dark. Uh, up next is uh, Pascal Breton, producer of Marseille. And finally, I'd like to introduce David Gope, the creator of Chef's Table, who is producing multiple new episodes in Europe. Thanks for joining us. Well, let's get to start with a question to David, last on the day's first to answer. Well, you've produced episodes of Chef's Table all over the world. It's what you can call a truly global series. Um, how important was that thought to you when you set out to create the series? Well, I think that a big part of the concept behind Chef's Table is to transport audiences to a restaurant to a place where they've never been before. And food is also such a, uh, a primal kind of desire that um, it just seems like something that really we should explore filming all over the world. And this would be the perfect platform to present it because it's displayed all over the world. Right. Um, how has launching the series on a, on a global platform impacted the reactions that you get when you travel around the world? Um, well, it's easier to get reservations, and um, there's a lot of free desserts sometimes. Um, but the, the great thing about it, from a production perspective, is that since everybody in the world, has, ha many people in the world have access to Netflix, it's become easier in our casting process, because we choose chefs that are too busy to be on television, usually. And so um, the show's popularity around the world has really helped us in convincing some of our chefs who normally wouldn't necessarily do a, a 10 day, you know, kind of all day shoot with us, um, are a little bit more willing to do so because maybe their son has seen the show before. What's the best thing you learned about cooking or working on the show? Uh, I think that the most important lesson is teamwork. Um, when I made Your Dreams of Sushi uh, a number of years ago, I was pretty much on my own in Japan. Uh, I didn't have a crew. Uh, the film was edited by my best friend and, and roommate, and so we had a team of maybe three people, and it was a lot of work. Um, so the idea to do Chef's Table um, really required kind of an army. Um, other directors, lots of editors, story producers to be able to produce something of a similar quality in, the, uh, in a faster amount of time. And um, you know, we look at these chefs, and their kitchens are full of people um, who are all kind of working in harmony to execute a vision. And so um, that was kind of the greatest lesson that I learned from watching these chefs and trying to apply it into our own productions. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about the future of Chef's Table. Um, there will be four episodes focusing on French chefs. I mean, being in Paris, of course, I have to ask you to tell us a little bit more about those episodes and why you wanted to put such an emphasis on France and French cuisine. Mm. Well, I love France and I love French food and so what a great way to make it my job to eat at the best French restaurants in the world. Um, our first season didn't have uh, an episode that focused on a French chef, but many of the characters in the first season had traveled to France to learn. Um, we didn't want to choose just one French chef, we wanted to um, do something special for France. and. Um, in doing so, we chose chefs who are doing different things in different parts of their career, and kind of they can expose different parts of French cuisine through talking, you know, through through telling their personal stories. So we have um, the great Alain Passard, who um, is kind of emblematic of French cuisine, at least for many people in the United States. And um, he, it's a fantastic story because he is such a risk taker. He was on top of the game in, in, in the food world and decided to remove all meat from his menu, which was a very kind of dramatic turn and uh, a risky one. And so we love chefs that are willing to kind of buck the trends and tradition and do something completely different um, while risking everything. 
Um, we also um, have the story of uh, Michel Foigro, and in telling his story, we get to tell the story of Nouvelle Cuisine. You know, his father, Pierre, who was you know, one of the Toigro brothers, uh, Jean and Pierre Toigro, and we have uh, a lot of uh, amazing archival materials to kind of help tell that story. And so it's about uh, a guy who um, has been cooking salmon and sorrel his whole life, cooking his father's dishes, and he just wants to do something different. And so he's, he struggles to move into the future while still showing respect for the past. And then we have two um, younger chefs, uh, Adeline Bertard, who um, is, uh, has a very cool restaurant called Yamcha in Paris and uses um, Chinese um, influences in her cooking. She, you know, she went abroad and fell in love with a man in Hong Kong, and together they opened this small restaurant in Paris. And um, you know, he learned, uh, sorry, Adeline learned from Pas uh, the great Pascal Barbeau, who learned from Passard, and so there's an interesting kind of um, transmission that happens between our episodes there. And then um, Alexandre Kuyan, who um, is on an island um, and is very isolated and is kind of doing something. Not a lot of people have heard of him, but he is an emerging chef. He has two Michelin stars and is doing amazing things with seafood on an island where the road to access it um, disappears underwater twice a day. And so um, all different types of settings and different types of chefs with different types of stories. And through that kind of contrast, we try to, you know, each episode is its own documentary, but together we try to give a, a, a greater picture yes. than, than a single one would. There's also going to be other episodes in other countries in Europe. That's right. So we are very fortunate in that we, um, so we are, we are just, we've just completed a new six episode um, series, which takes place all over the world, everywhere from Thailand um, to the United States, and that, um, Uh, premieres on May 27th. Our French episodes will come out later in the year, and then there will be another six episodes that will take place all over the world um, that will come out later. Right. Looking even further into the future, moving over to Bo and uh, Janske, uh, the news about your series, Dark, has made quite a big splash in the film and TV industry, especially, of course, in Germany. Uh, this being the first series made in Germany Uh, for Netflix, uh, how, well, for a lack of a better word, German will it be? How German can it be? And also, what's going to be the international angle if this is so German? Well, I, I think you get the whole German package. So it's basically German talent, German cast. It's entirely sh uh, shot in Germany. And um, it shows German suburban life from a different angle. Um, but I think what interested us the most was um, that Netflix actually gives you a platform um, to show something to a global audience. So this is not a specific German uh, story, but uh, we hope to actually reach, you know, a whole lot of people of those 75 million <laughs> out there. So, uh, yeah. Oh, oh you're... Um, yeah, it's like... I mean, we both are from film school, and we know us from film school, and starting with short films, which also takes time to do, but sometimes spending them showing an audience where just five people sit there is like a big step for us, you know, that there's this big challenge actually and chance that so many people can see it. Uh, that's attracted us the most, honestly. Yes. Well, you're a very accomplished director, filmmaker, visual storyteller, as we've learned today. And, uh, you've made three f major feature films, two in Germany, one being Who Am I, of course, one in uh, Hollywood. How different is it working on a series now? And what are the, big, what are, what are the biggest differences and what's, what's the same? Well, It's the biggest difference for us as filmmakers or visual storytellers um, is actually it's much more work, to be honest. <laughs> it's, it's 10 episodes, each is an hour, so it's basically five feature films. Um, I did three so far and I feel older after them, so it will change me a lot, I guess, doing that. But we're looking forward to do it, like it's just to create this big universe is much more intriguing to be honest than actually doing a feature film because we also write our stuff and usually you always know what, at least after nine pages, 90 pages or 120 pages uh, you have to stop the story you know and this time when we started writing dark uh, it felt 
it freed us, honestly, not knowing what the end will be, you know, and that's for a creative part very interesting. Also, I think what you can do with the characters is so different, <coughs> like, when you, when you write for a film, you actually, you have, you have to end, you have to end your character arc at some point, you have to make a choice, and, um, yeah, to create a world and to follow those characters through this world is just, it's cool. Yeah. Speaking of differences, Pascal, um, how does producing a series shot in France for Netflix uh, differ from other networks that you have worked with in the past? I would say ambition. Uh, of course, in the budget, but when you, when, you, when you need to talk to 75 million people, you need to find some icons, like Gerard Depardieu, obviously, is a, a French icon. And also, you need to make the place where you're shooting bigger. And as you could see in the trailer, uh, Marseille is very important, very strong. Maybe the main character of the show. And we we tried in in the stadium, in the in the city hall, in many places. We tried to make Marseille look bigger than it is. And it's already big, and it's one of these three or four main cities in the world that oversee the, the sea or the ocean that are so fascinating, like Naples or Rio, Barcelona, and uh, San Francisco, maybe Hong Kong. There are not so many. And that was, that was a very important part of the show for me. Yes. Well, Marseille launches globally on May 5th. Um, what do you think that uh, audiences outside of France will find particularly appealing about it. What France can bring to the world? Many things, food for instance, <laughs> fashion, sometimes sex, let's see. Uh, the show is very sexy. Uh, but what can we bring? We can, what did we bring in history? We brought the revolution. That is, <laughs> it's happening every day in the streets of Paris, even every night now. Uh, and it's a kind of passion for politics, you know, very strange passion for politics in France. We, we love politics so much that we hate our politicians, we can even sometimes cut their head. And uh, that's really also a very important part of Marseille. The third part of Marseille, is, it's just universal. It's a family tragedy, tragedy based in a way of, on some Shakespeare works, or, which are themselves based on some Greek uh, tragedies. So it's always the same stories in a way, but these are the best stories and when they are set in such a world, it, it, and with such big actors, it's becoming fascinating and, and I hope universal. Yes, well the same way as Dark is going to be a pioneering work for Germany, Marseille has been a, or is a pioneering work for France. It's the first series produced yeah, and it was Netflix. But was the way, was the journey the way you expected it to be? Yeah, in the beginning, uh, of course, that was a big challenge, and the French industry is very, you know, very conservative and very rich as well. So it was not easy to attract the best talents. And after after a few few time, when we had a good script, then I could get a great movie director, and then great. The best actors wanted to do it, and now everybody wants to do the show, and even the second season. And that's really changing the rules and the, ga and, and the game, and I think it, a lot of things are going to change after, after this show, and, uh, and it's, also, it's already changing, even in the, in the other channels, because they, they want to accelerate uh, what they, what the, the kind of shows they're going to produce. Yeah. Well, I think challenging the rules of the game is pretty much an operative word for all of you here, um, challenging the rules of the game are also you two, because you always work as a team, Bo and Jantje. Can you give us some insight into the workings? How do you work as a team? Why does it work? How does it work? Well, I some advice from the, from the French. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're a couple as well. Um, yeah, we, we, we're a couple since 13 years now, and so we work and we love together, and um, that, yeah. Yeah, we yell each other a lot, and 
Um, no, but it's like it's interesting because we can't bullshit each other, you know. Yeah. I know her; she knows me. That's easy. Um, well, the production of, of your series is, lies pretty far ahead, but can you already tell what you want audiences to take from your series once it's done? I think a, a unique experience, like ex especially um, for the German audience, to kind of see that we can do something different in the way we tell stories. And um, yeah, it will be a little bit mind-challenging, and I think that's, um, that's what people can take from it as well. Yeah. Well, David, you've already produced uh, a season or a second season already, but one's already aired. Uh, would you also say it was kind of a different experience for you? To do the more to do more seasons after the first no, season. Well, also even the first season doing it for Netflix. Well, sure. I mean, I think the great thing about um, the great thing about working with Netflix was that nobody before nobody thought the show could be possible because every food show had to have a host. There had to be a personality that kind of walked you through it, and the idea that the chefs would be telling their own stories was kind of um, considered to be not within the format of, of, of food television. Netflix gave us the opportunity to, to do this, um, which is incredible. And I think the big thing that we learned from the first season is really what the show is about. And we discovered that it's really kind of the origin stories of these chefs. We kind of likened to the chefs being superheroes, and we're trying to tell the story of their origin. How they can all do things that no one else can do. These are their powers of cooking. And how did they get those powers? What was the, you know, the radioactive spider that bit them and gave them the ability or gave them the passion or the motivation? And so our films are trying to unravel this kind of mystery about not what they cook, but why they cook. And the, food, the show is really more about people than it is about cooking, but it's set in kind of this incredibly beautiful world of food. And chefs are just such compelling characters because we always want what they have. We, 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 we fiend for their cooking, you know, we lust for it. And at the same time, they're such dynamic and interesting characters that, um, I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's so much fun to make. I mean, that's the real reason that we do it. All right, thanks. Great last words. We have to wrap this up already. Um, well, thanks so much for joining us on stage. Um, and we're going to pass back over to Jonathan for our next panel. Thank you very much. Okay.